Hi, this is Eric Prostowski, and welcome to another episode of EP on EP. It's an absolute delight to have a friend of mine for many years, Dr. Ed Gerstenfeld, who is Professor of Medicine and Director of Clinical Electrophysiology Service at UCSF, to discuss a topic that I think is very important, and that's whether scar in the heart makes a difference in how you select people for defibrillators who are at risk for sudden death. So, Ed, welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, let's get right on with it. Let me, these are two patients from my own collection, Ed. Uh, the first is a 42-year-old man who underwent optimal medical therapy and had a non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy with class two heart failure symptoms. Sort of a, you know, a routine case that one would see for possible ICD involvement. I went ahead and did a CMR before considering an ICD. And in his case, there was negative delayed enhancement. So how does that affect your judgment, Ed? How, how would you approach a patient like that? And he has no uh, symptoms, and you said you've done some monitoring and any uh, not stained ventricular tachycardia? Uh, good point. Uh, we didn't do extended monitoring. You know, I think it was maybe a Holter and PBCs, no, no non-sustained VT, uh, and symptoms of heart failure, but nothing else. Gotcha. And his EF, you said, is around 30%. 30, 30% after several months of good medical therapy. Yeah. So this is obviously a common uh, problem that has been somewhat controversial over the years, which is obviously why you're breaking it up. Uh, we know that the, the risk in general in patients with non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathies is lower than patients with post-myocardial uh, infarction cardiomyopathies. And uh, there's a fair bit of, of uh, you know, controversy in the literature, right? There was this definite study, which was a large a study run by Alan Kadish in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, randomized to defibrillators or not. And although there was a trend that, that did not hit significance in terms of benefit, and you know, the real study that pushed, you know, gained approval, I'd say, for implantation of defibrillator and showed a benefit was a scud -Hef study, uh, which did show a, a, a mortality benefit uh, to implantation of uh, an implantable defibrillator. But I always, I use a scud -Hef study and I keep those numbers in mind, if you look at the mortality benefit in general, it was around 7% over five years. So I, I keep that in mind when I'm talking to patients, that over five years is about a one and a half percent per year improvement in your mortality. So it's not 50%, right? It's not 30%, it's about one and a half percent. Is that important? Well, it may be important to some patients, it may be less important uh, to others. Um, there's also obviously downsides, which is why you're bringing that up, that go along with a defibrillator. There's risk of shocks when you don't need them from a normal fast heart rhythm. There are infections, and, and those on average, you know, most studies may be, uh, you know, 5% or so over those five years or higher. So you're looking at about a 1% uh, risk of, you know, not mortality, but some potential downside, and maybe 1.5% of a mortality upside. And this whole area has become more controversial since a uh, study, you know, the Danish study, which randomized about, uh, you know, 500 patients, again, with modern therapy. So the scud -Hef study, you could say, was done, you know, probably 10 years ago. We didn't have as good medical therapy. We didn't have biventricular devices. The Danish study uh, randomized patients with modern medical therapy, and about half the patients in those studies uh, and that study got biventricular pacing. I didn't ask you about, you know, the EKG in this patient, so I'd be interested to know if it's a narrow QRS or wide QRS. Yeah, no, um, it's not, not a CRT candidate. Good point. Okay, narrow QRS. So in that study, um, there was no overall mortality benefits to non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. Again, ejection fraction under 35% who received an implantable defibrillator. And if you look at the subgroups, though, you know, one important subgroup is younger patients, right? Patients under 70 in general did have a mortality benefit. Um, and then you bring up an important point, which I think when you're sort of on the fence um, is imaging. And obviously intuitively, I mean, I tend to think, I'm sure you do, that you need, you know, some scar potentially uh, to facilitate, you know, re-entry or, or VF. Um, and studies have shown that, although as we mentioned, there's some uh, controversy. So this Danish study did have an MRI substudy where they looked at it, you know, about half the patients had good quality MRIs. And it turned out if you had scar that did, um, was associated with higher mortality, but the defibrillator, at least in that study, 
um, did not change that mortality. It reduced sudden death by about half, but didn't change overall mortality. The other big you know, recent study is this Gutman study that was done in Australia. Again, about 500 patients, um, retrospective. But in that group, people who had a scar on MRI were the ones who benefited from the defibrillator. The ones without a scar um, did not benefit. So again, if you're on the fence, I think the presence of scar does certainly make me worry more. And I would say, you know, increase the risk. Um, you know, in this patient, EF 30, so lower EF makes me more worried. Obviously, EF in the you know 35% um, makes me less worried than an EF at 25%. So 30 is somewhere in the middle, but 30% is getting me a little worried. They have PVCs, but not non-stained VT, and they're they're in their 40s. They have some it sounds like class two heart failure. So again, what I do, and I think you know some of us think you know we have to have the answer right when we go talk to a patient. This is what you need, but as you know. It's a, it's a discussion and you know, the, the hashtag is the sort of shared decision-making, but it really is. You sit with your patient and you don't have to have the answer. You say, listen, um, there's a chance that you may die suddenly, right? That it, that it, it could happen. That chance is not huge. I, I give them the Scott Huff data. I say, you know, probably one and a half percent per year over the next five years and this device could, could save your life. Um, on the other hand, there are risks. You can get a shock. Um, when you don't need it, you can end up having a problem with a device or an infection. Um, and then you have that, you know, discussion with the patient. I think it's someone like this, where they're in their 40s, um, they have a lot of potential life ahead of them. They don't have severe class four heart failure where they have competing causes of death. They don't have renal failure on dialysis. Um, I think they have a lot of potential life to be gained. So even though, you know, if the MR showed a scar, it might be a little more forceful. Um, I would say that I think an ICD is certainly reasonable in this patient. Well, that's a great discussion. Um, so I'm a little, I've changed over the years. Uh, I was, as you know, most people know, I've been fairly bullish on ICDs over the years. Um, and th there are multiple papers now, you, you alluded to a couple that have shown that in the absence of SCAR, and you and I are EP, so we understand the concept SCAR does tend to promote reentry, and it's it makes sense to me pathophysiologically, Ed, the, the data that's been coming out with SCAR burden, at least in the non-ischemics. So um, it's interesting. I, I was leaning with this patient actually to not put an ICD, but as you said, it was a shared decision-making uh, uh, discussion. And the other thing is there are some of these patients who developed uh, who have you know late recovery of ejection fractions? You know we've all seen that. So um, I did just what you suggested. I went and spoke to him, and I did tell him that here's the risk pool. You're in it, but you're at but the scar not being there. I told him honestly, you're at the lower end of the risk pool. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I would agree yeah, and he actually opted uh, for the moment not to have one, but he wants to think about it some more, which I think is very reasonable. Uh, and I gave him the same discussion you did. I think one of the reasons I wanted to discuss this with you is I think a lot of our colleagues forget to get the CMR before they go right for a device. And, and I'd like to get your opinion. Do you think this should be a routine test before you consider device? I think so. It's certainly come to be our routine. In addition, I don't know if it'll add much all the time, but I usually will get uh, genetics as well, because sometimes you might, although it's rare, see, I've picked up some high-risk mutations, a filament C or Titan splicing mutations that may put them at higher risk. So I think these days in 2020, I would get genetics and I would absolutely get a CMR. I mean, there are, you know, one of the challenges is once the device is in, you know, there are techniques to minimize noise, but you never get as good a quality CMR. And you see patients all the time who've had this device implanted and um, the images aren't as good. So I think uh, in terms of looking at the risk stratification, looking at baseline, uh, it is useful. And I want to emphasize one other point that you made, because I've had lots of these patients I follow as well, who looking at the risks and benefits decide or, you know, not to get an ICD. But the important thing is, you know, you don't have to make the absolute yes or no decision today with me in the office, right? You can think about it. And if you don't want the ICD, we'll continue to follow you. I think that's important in terms of documentation. You know, I think one of the reasons people just put an ICD in everyone is they're worried about, you know, medical legal consequences. What if hmm. two years later, this patient drops dead, right? Are you going to be liable? Well, I think you document that you had the discussion 
and you tell the patient, I'm gonna to continue to follow you. I'm gonna get you know, another monitor in a year, maybe another MR in two years. And you know, we can see if that fibrosis has changed. And if things change, you start having not staying VT, we can decide to put the defibrillator in later. So I think um, documenting that you're gonna to continue to follow the patient, that you may decide to put it in if things change, that you had that discussion are all uh, you know, important. Uh, so just a, we only have a couple of minutes, but let me ask you something that's bothered me. Uh, it bothered me from the view that I don't quite understand it. Uh, most of the literature would suggest when it's looked into subgrouping that just the presence of fibrosis in a non-ischemic, not, not the percentage of fibrosis, puts you at risk. And just that sort of mid-wall fibrosis you typically see on these CMRs, but for the hypertrophs, it seems to be different. I mean, there are several papers suggesting that it's a percent of, of, of fibrosis. For example, 5% does, doesn't put you at anywhere near the risk if you had 15 or 20%. Um, why do you think, Ed, and I, I don't have an answer to this, but why do you think if you can have 5% fibrosis in a, in a non-ischemic dilated myopathy and put you at a higher risk, but in a hypertroph, it seems to be not as much. I don't understand that. Yeah, I mean, I, my reading the literature, Eric, is that it is a gradation, you know, for when you're writing your paper, you like a cutoff. Um, right. And I view it, you know, again, the, the data clearly, the 15% for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, was the, the best cutoff in terms of risk. And, you know, no one wants to hang their hat and, and put an ICD on a single risk factor of, of fibrosis alone. But I think even from that data, there is a gradation that you know, 10 to 15 is higher than five to 10, which is higher than less than five. And I think that's true in, in non-ischemics as well. I think it's similar to in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the wall thickness, right? So right. everyone knows greater than 30 is high risk. You absolutely would get an ICD. But what people don't realize is there's a gradation. So 20 to 25 is higher than less than 20 and 25 to 30 is high. So you know, if I have a hypertroph with a wall thickness of 28 um, and his, his uh, fibrosis burden is five, that makes me more worried than if their thickness is 18. So I think these are, you know, statistical cutoffs. And, you know, but, so I don't think that 14 is necessarily that much lower than 16, um, but five probably at overall is, is lower risk. So it makes, no. makes sense in general that more scar is higher risk and that there are these cutoffs that help differentiate them. So I wouldn't Oh, I'm sorry. I, mean, up, but, no, I just say I wouldn't like hang my hat on right. a particular number. But I, I will tell you this. Uh, 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 it's funny you said 28%. You, if you will believe this, uh, I had a patient with 28, I mean, 28, not percent, 28 millimeters. Uh, millimeters and uh, the insurance company turned down this person who had non had had they didn't have non sustained at that point, but had had fibrosis that had 28 millimeters, typical anthem, you know, kind of request. And they, <laughs> yeah. Oh, seriously. Oh, and, they, the and they said, they said, no, they actually turned it down. I had to monitor this patient for like three weeks. And I got, I think one four beat run of VT, you know, and then they said, okay. Now I will tell you personally, I think that fibrosis, significant fibrosis is a higher risk factor than non-sustained VT in, in a, in a, at least older than 30 uh, hypertroph, I have found non-sustained VT to almost be non-specific in my experience over the years. Yeah, well, I think it depends. And as you know, nowadays with these 14, you know, 21 day continuous monitors, it's different than the, the 24 hour Holter we used to do. It's right. pretty unusual for a 14 day monitor not to see one run of non-sustained VT. And right. again, non-sustained VT, it's not a dichotomous variable, right? You see right. runs of 20 beats, you know, of, of pleomorphic, that's going to make you more worried than, right. than one or two four beat runs. The other thing I was going to mention, just to wrap up, um, when it comes to quantifying the delayed enhancement, that's also not necessarily a black or white process, right? So um, right. I've shown two different radiologists and gotten two different quantifications, and there's different methodology for that. There's the you know, based on standard deviation of normal, there's based on this half, you know, half at, at pulse width. Uh, so you shouldn't talk to your radiologist as you probably do. I sit down with the radiologist and go over these scans myself um, and take a look because I've seen a report, but then I sit with Charlie Higgins, you know, who developed delayed enhancement. And he says, oh no, it's much more than that. So I think looking at the, the primary data yourself, looking at the, the, you know, the strips from the monitor, looking at the MR um, all the way in. 
Well, listen, it's been a great uh, time with you, Ed, as always. Um, and I think the message I hope that gets out to our colleagues is that um, doing a CMR gives you important information. It's part of, but not the final right uh, piece of information to help you with a decision. But if you don't get one and then put an ICD, like you said, uh, you really can't get the pictures that you want. It's not like a pacemaker where you can still get good pictures. At least that's been in our own experience. So I think your message is it's useful. If I'm, if I'm summarizing, it's part of how you stratify risk and it adds to making a clinical decision. Is that fair? I think so. That's very fair. And again, some people may say, well, the cardiac MRI at my hospital, you know, that they're not as good, but there's always going to be a, a center probably that has good quality uh, MRs. And obviously you need uh, the, a good quality MR and good quality readers. But I agree, especially, I don't know if you've seen it, but with the subcutaneous ICDs, there's just so much artifact that oh. it's hard to get a, a good quality MR. Once yeah, no, um, uh, we're dealing with a patient right now, and I'll end with this. Um, who I got involved in peripherally, um, a, a young gal who's seven months pregnant who came in with syncope and ugly looking polymorphic VT that we've quieted down in the hospital, but you can't give GAD and during pregnancy. Yeah. So, and so we've made a decision to use a wearable uh, cardioverter defibrillator for the last hopefully month, then we'll get, hopefully get baby out safely and covered it with some beta blockers and so far. But, but just what you said, because we're headed in that direction and if we go do that now, we will never get a good look at what's going on. And I think that's something she's going to probably need. So very good point you raised with the SICD. But Ed, as always, a wonderful, wonderful to spend some time with you. And I'm sure our listeners will uh, have benefited from it. Stay safe and stay healthy. You too. Thanks, Eric. It's great being here. And hope this is helpful for the, for the heart rhythm audience.